Genesis chapter number 16 is where we left off last week. Uh, Genesis chapter 16, if you recall, um, Genesis chapter 15, you have um, uh, um, uh, the Lord came unto, uh, the word of the Lord came unto Abram, and you have uh, God making a, a covenant that Abraham believed in, in, in the Lord that Abraham believed God and God counted unto him for righteousness. So we have this faithful account of Abraham and then we turn around into Genesis chapter number 16 and what do we have that shows up on the scene? You know, it's it's human nature, right? It's it's human nature that shows up, it's the doubt. I'm sure glad that not everybody in the Bible was perfect because it would make me feel even worse than I already do. One of the great things about the Bible and one of the reasons why you know that it's true is no, no, no author you know, ever writes a, a book about themselves and paints them out to be a sinner, to make them make, paints them out to be a failure over and over and over again. So we have, well, hello, Linda. It's good to see you. <laughs> is it just you this evening or is Rich with you? Okay. Rich, your, your wife has made it safely here to, to church. We'll take good care of her while she's here. All right. Um, I was saying that if, uh, in, the, in the scripture, one of the reasons why you know that God authored, God authored it is that, and I'm not saying this is one of those infallible proofs that prove it absolutely, but one of the reasons you know it is that with all of the different authors of the Bible, what you find consistently throughout it is that people who wrote, wrote about their failures and wrote about the failures of God's people, even those who are the elect of God. You know, you have the, those in the reformed camp who would say that, you know, those who are predestined are God, the God's elect, that, you know, those are the ones going to heaven. Over and over again, you find God's elect are the ones, they, they wind up going to hell because God's elect in the Old Testament don't wind up fulfilling the purpose that they have for them. Someone who is elect is someone who is to fulfill the purpose that God has for them, that God has a purpose. Um, But the priesthood certainly did not fulfill uh, God's purposes. My point being is that here when we get to Genesis chapter number 16 is we have another incident where you know the nature of, uh, of man and sinful flesh and how we doubt God that right after after Abraham's account of faithfulness in chapter 15, we find Sarah coming to Abraham and what does Sarah say? Let's bring about this seed of yours. Let's bring about this promised one that God has promised us. And in order to bring us this about, Abram, I've got this great idea. Why don't you just take my handmaid, Hagar, and go in unto her and then we can, we can speed this along, Right? And, um, you know, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, the two of them didn't work very well together. They didn't withstand. And uh, we have the same thing here in Gen- uh, Genesis chapter number 16. So we talked about that last week and, 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 and Abram going into to Hagar. I'd like to pick up in verse number 10 this week. And let's just read down through the end of the chapter. Genesis chapter number 16 and verse number 10. It says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Uh, This is the angel of the Lord, if you recall, appearing to Hagar out in the wilderness because Sarah had dealt harshly with Hagar after Hagar uh, conceives a, a child. And, you know, there's this animosity between Hagar and Sarah because Sarah goes, I can't take it anymore, Abram. Now she's pregnant and, 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 and she's despised. Hagar's despising the position there. So anyways, we, she's in the wilderness. And who is it that comes? The angel of the Lord said unto her, that is unto Hagar, Behold, thou art with child and shalt bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Ber Lehoriah, 
Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So what we have going on here is we have the angel appearing unto Hagar, and can you imagine what it was that Hagar must have felt? You remember, what, did you ever experienced a time in your life where you've been rejected for something? You've been the outcast? You feel all alone? Hagar was just kicked out. She, 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 well, she fled from, from the face of Sarah because of the harsh treatment. She, she's not in a very good position here. She's all alone. She's out in the wilderness and the Lord appears unto her. Can you imagine what this does for her? But the angel of the Lord tells her that, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're with child. And what does, what does the Lord say about this child? Verse number 12, and he will be a wild man and his hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, there's a, a lot that could be said here, <laughs> but for the sake of brevity and for the sake of not turning this into a history lesson about the Arab nations, uh, we'll just suffice it to say that this wild man is going to dwell next to Israel and he is going to be against everyone. And we're going to see that this, what the Lord says is going to be true. They're going to be warlike this son Ishmael comes from not only Shem, but comes from Ham. Because Abraham comes from the lineage of Shem. And Hagar is from where? Egypt. She's a Hamite. So you have the, 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 the Shem who are the more of the, you know, the, 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 if you look at the great religions of the world, they all come from Shem. And uh, so you have this mix between Shem and Ham, and it says they're going to be warlike, and who is it that creates a religion that is warlike? Where does the Muslim religion come from, right? Who is the ones that abide by the religion that says we're going to convert people by the sword, right? Now, it, just for full disclosure, because people will say, well, yeah, but doesn't the Bible talk about in the Old Testament about God killing people in the land? It sure does. People like to use that as an excuse for God being capricious or, or, or uh, wicked. But, but God is not. We, we covered those things, if you recall, when we went through Satan's strategy and we saw how Satan was infiltrating the land with wickedness and how there was uh, the, the, the angels had come down and had relations with the daughters of, uh, of men and had put these in the land. And, and so there was this corruption of the seed line that God was dealing with. And so when he says, you know, don't let any man, woman, or child, and we look at that and we say, wow, that's pretty harsh. Well, there was wickedness going on and that was a plot of the devil to overtake God's promises. And uh, you remember the, uh, uh, God talks about the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. There, there, it was going to go further and further and further. So anyways, my point being here is that when we look at Ishmael, he's going to be a warlike people and, and we have seen that over and over and over again down throughout history. And we, saw, we see that they, you know, in, the, in the Middle East, he dwells in the presence of his brethren, right? But it's, it's, it's warlike between them. Uh, recently, they've been you know, united against common en enemies that have, that have kept their internal turmoil at bay. Um, but anyways, the, the world doesn't like to talk about generalizing people like that or profiling people, right? You remember back after September 11th, we, couldn't, we can't profile anybody, you know? So we have to let the people go who, you know, that we think, you know, if we were to profile, we should stop. And we have to stop, you know, the 90-year-old grandmothers going through security because we can't profile, you know? The world doesn't like to talk about those things, but the Bible is very specific about what it says about people. Now, it says in verse number 15 that Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his uh, son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And I want you to turn over to, always hold your place here in, in Genesis chapter number 16, but I'd like you to come over to Galatians chapter number 4. 
Galatians chapter number four. Because what I wanna show you is that we have two, uh, well, we have a, a, a woman who's really introduced to us in this chapter in Hagar, and we have Sarah. Uh, Sarai, who then is Sarah. And these two women are used by Paul as an example. Do you recall what Paul uses these two women as an example of? He uses Sarah and, and Hagar as an example of two covenants. And so I'm gonna read a, a few verses to you here out of Galatians chapter number four because I, I, I don't wanna go through and dissect it and go verse by verse. So that's, we're gonna read a, a group of, of a few verses together and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Galatians chapter four, look at verse number 21. It says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. And by the way, before I start reading this, maybe I should explain the context of the book of Galatians. Paul comes along, the Israel rejects their Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ comes in his earthly ministry. They preach the gospel of the kingdom. He, they're, they're teaching the law. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ tells Israel everything. You know, they sit in Moses' seat, the Pharisees. Therefore, you do everything that they say. You do what they say, you don't do what they do. He instructs them to keep the law. The Lord Jesus Christ never did away with the law in his earthly ministry. It wasn't until after Israel rejected their Messiah in the early book of Acts that God cuts off Israel because of their unbelief, turns to the apostle Paul, and sends Paul out to the whole world, not just Israel, because you remember the, the, the twelve's ministry was to Israel first, and then they were to go out to the whole world. But because of Israel's unbelief, they never got past Israel. So when God sends Paul to go to the whole world, Paul has to go up to Jerusalem to say, uh, guess what, guys? God has changed the program, and here's what God's doing now. If you want to read the account of that, go to Acts chapter number 15. That's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because that's one of the ones that helped me to see that there is, in fact, a difference in the Bible and that I shouldn't be keeping the law today and I shouldn't be sacrificing and, and trying to circumcise to be in a covenant relationship with God. But Paul is committed unto him this, this, this revelation of the mystery, this certain body of doctrine where God tells him to go and preach the gospel of the grace of God, how that men are saved by grace through faith, that they're, they're saved by putting their faith in what Christ did for them on the cross. Now, back in the Old Testament or in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in early Acts, what did, what did Israel have to do? Well, if they wanted to be in covenant relationship with God, they had to circumcise when they were eight days old, and they had to keep the law, right? God said, keep my commandments. So they're keeping the law and being circumcised. So when Paul comes along and starts preaching the grace of God, what was the response of these Israelites who were used to keeping the law. They said, no, 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 it's necessary that you keep the law and circumcise in order to be saved. But Paul says, it's no longer of works, it's by grace alone. So he establishes a church in Galatia and he teaches them about grace and how you're saved by grace through faith and you're not saved by your works of your flesh. You're not, you're not, you don't have a good standing by the works of your flesh. And he leaves them and he hears that they're going back and they're putting themselves under the law. And can you imagine Paul's frustration? You know, he wants to pull his hair out. He puts his hands up. What are you doing? Why, why would you think that it would be better to go back under the law and put yourself under bondage than to have the liberty of the grace of God working in your life? So with, with uh, Paul is dealing with this in Galatians chapter one where he talks about his apostleship. Uh, in Galatians chapter two where he talks about his doctrine not being the same as Peter's. That Peter, James, and John were to go uh, with, uh, to the circumcision. Galatians chapter number two verse seven. But contrary wise when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was un unto Peter. You notice that Peter's not just going to the circumcision, that he's preaching the gospel of the circumcision. There's two different gospels there. You talk to people, you know, by the way, you get a new Bible version and they'll butcher those verses because it doesn't fit their theology. 
And so what, the one thing that you need to be clear there is that there's two different messages. And Christianity today has become impotent because they've mixed Israel's program with the dispensation of grace. They've mixed law with grace and what you have is a puppy chasing its own tail because they don't know which side is up. They think, well, we should keep the law, but we know Paul's talking about grace, so which parts of the law do we keep? How do we, what parts of grace do we keep? And we just wind up with confusion and we wind up with something like 36,000 different denominations because this denomination says we're going to keep these things of the law, and this denomination says, no, 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 we're only going to keep these issues of the law, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. But we come to Galatians chapter number four after Paul has, has dealt with the message. He's dealing with the issue of, oh, foolish Galatians. And he comes and he's going to give an example. And this is where we find ourselves in Galatians chapter four and verse number 21. Galatians four twenty-one. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? What does the law tell you? Anybody? The law tells you that if you transgress just in one part, you're guilty of it all. And if you're guilty of the law, what's the sentence? Is it probation? Death. So Paul is, tell me, you people who desire to be under the law, don't you hear it? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. So here is Hagar, the bondmaid, and Sarah, the free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. And by the way, maybe I, I just point out here because I want to be crystal clear. We are not in 19th century Germany where they take the scripture and they say that everything in the Old Testament is an allegory and they try to allegorize the scripture. When Paul says that this is an allegory, it doesn't mean that Sarah and Hagar weren't real people. <laughs> but God is able to use real history to accomplish his purposes and to provide an example for us. So, these things are an allegory, but they are true. Genesis chapter number 16 is true, little, true literal history. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. What was given at Mount Sinai? The law. The law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. So this uh, bondwoman uh, is the allegorically representing the covenant of the law. And answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that, breakest, that bearest not, break forth and cry, Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And boy, we could spend a lot of time in these passages, but I just want to try to make some comments so we understand what Paul's saying and we understand what's happening back in Genesis chapter number 16. So Paul says in verse number 20. Four, that these are the two covenants. Hagar, law, bondage, flesh, works. That's what she is. Why, why is the allegory there? She was a handmaiden. She was under bondage, right? She was a servant. Remember in the script, what serveth the law? You know, the law is a servant. It serves a purpose. 
It's not free. It's not at liberty to do as it pleases. The other covenant is that of promise, that God says, I'm going to do it. You can liken promise to grace, right? Because when a promise is given, what do you have to do to receive it? So we have two things that are diametrically opposed, these two covenants, just as Sarah and Hagar are diametrically opposed. They don't get along, do they? They, I mean, Hagar flees from Sarah. Later on, I think it's in Genesis chapter 21 that Sarah winds up kicking Hagar out of the house. Um, you know, the, the, spirit, the, the angel of the Lord tells Hagar, go back unto Sarah and serve her. And so Hagar is going to go back, but that's not going to last forever. In Genesis 21, Sarah winds up kicking her out. So Galatians says that these two ladies are two covenants. And so Hagar, representing the law, representing flesh, um, is the issue. Why why is it that Hagar represents flesh? Well, simply put, what happened in Genesis chapter number 15? There was a promise given to Abraham, but instead of resting in the promise, Sarah and Abram uh, go to seek to bring about the blessing in their own flesh. In Abraham's own flesh, he's going to try to bring it about. The law can never bring blessing. Never. It can never bring about the promise. For the law says if you transgress, you are guilty of it all. And transgression of the law is sin, which brings death, and no life can be found in the law. None. So Sarah then, on the opposite side, represents the covenant of promise. This is the one that's furnished by grace because God does it all. You remember the covenant that God makes with Abram where Abram's asleep and God makes the covenant all by himself? God is going to be the one that brings this about all by himself. There are no conditions attached to it. God doesn't say, if you do this, I will give you a son. God gives it to him by promise, by grace. The covenant of works requires promise. I'm sorry, require the the covenant of, 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 of works, the covenant of law requires works, but the covenant of promise requires no works. So you, you see how what's going on with Sarah and Hagar and what's coming about and the life that is coming from flesh and how that relates to law and grace in the book of Galatians? That no life comes from the law, Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. Life only comes through the promise of God. And through that, he's giving it to you today by his son, by promise, by grace. So, if you don't have faith in what God has promised that he's going to bring about, you're going to go out to try to accomplish it in your, in your own flesh, right? Isn't that what people do today in, in Christianity and in churchianity, right? They, 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 they want to be a good Christian. I want to be a good person. I want to, you know, let's be like Christ. I, I agree. We should, we should, Try to be like, uh, well, how, how, no, how do I want to say this? We can't be like Christ. But what we do is we read the doctrine and we put these words into our body and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we put Christ's life on display through us. If we don't have the knowledge of the truth, God's word residing within us, and we just step out And in our own flesh and in our own bodies and say, I'm going to try to be like Christ. And I'm going to do it based on what I think is good and what I think is right. Therefore, we have Christians who stand for principles today that are unbiblical, that are contrary to the Bible. You know, killing of children in the womb. And and they stand for these things. And you say, how could a Christian believe these things? Because they're not operating from the source of truth. They're going about to establish their own righteousness in their own flesh based upon what they think 
is right. But faith will rest and believe in what God said. So when God says, I'm going to give you a son, you're not the flesh, or if, you're, if you, faith is not going to go to try to bring that about and produce that based upon their own flesh. So the covenant of promise does not require anything to continue in it. God had purposed this in himself before creation, before man had ever, ever even existed. And just as the covenant of promise came to Abram before the covenant at Sinai, right? Didn't promise come before the law which was given at Sinai? So too does Sarah being joined to Abraham come before Hagar, right? We have the, the two women who represent the two covenants. Which one came for it first? Sarah was married to Abraham before Hagar was. The promise came first. And so we see this example in Sarah and Hagar. We have two sons that come from these two women. Two women that, that represent two different covenants. One of law, one of flesh, the other of promise, the other of grace. And the two children that come, Ishmael is a type of the flesh, and who's Abraham and Sarai's son? Isaac, who is a type of promise? Well, there's also two other sons in scripture. You have the first man, two men. Adam was the first man, and Christ was the last man. And Hagar bore the first son, Ishmael, not Sarah. The first son that comes was fleshly. It's the second son that's born that is the one of promise. So Adam is the first man who is fleshly and we sin and we have our sin nature from Adam and it's the second man, it's the last Adam who comes who is the son of promise who comes and brings us life. So Isaac is a type of those walking in promise Go back to uh, chapter number three of Galatians here. Look at verse number 23 of Galatians three. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Before faith came, what was there? Law. Before the one that would come by faith, Isaac, came the law, Ishmael. Now, what was Hagar's role and and purpose? Hagar was the handmaid to Sarah. She was the help. She was, that was her purpose. She was never intended to be joined unto Abram as his wife. Look at verse number 24 right now in in Galatians 3. It says, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Was the law meant to save you? No. No. The law was never meant to save us. It was only meant to teach us. To teach us what? Our need of Christ. It says the law was our schoolmaster to do what? What is the purpose of the law? To bring us unto Christ. The law is the handmaid, right? Hagar is the handmaid to Sarah. She's the helper. What is the law to us? The law is not grace to us. The law is our handmaid. The law is the help to bring us to Christ, to see our need of a Savior. And it assists those to bring them to the promise of life by grace. Why do I say that? I'm I'm not propping the law up as if it's graceful, as if it gives you life. But if, if you had not known that it was wrong, to, uh, that you had transgressed God's law, God's righteousness, you would have never known that you needed a Savior, right? You would have just gone about in your life and thought, well, I, you know, I'm pretty good. 
because you wouldn't have had any righteous standard to know that you had transgressed. So the law was, is not there for us to keep. And I'll, I'll say one thing. I, I'm glad that God gave the law. I'm glad that I don't live under the law. I'm glad that I live under grace, but I'm also glad that God gave the law for a period of time. Why is that? Well, number one, it reveals his righteous standard. But number two, in eternity future, when we're in heaven and we stand before the throne, no one will be able to say, I could have done it in my flesh, God. There will be no room for boasting in heaven because the law was given upon earth and man sees that he cannot attain to the righteousness of God. Now, the law was our handmaid. Look over at Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter number seven. And then we'll get back to Genesis. Romans chapter seven and look at verse number 12. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Should we, should we degradate the law? Should we degradate it? Should we say that it's terrible? Should we say that it's bad? You know, those of us who believe in grace, I'm a grace believer. I believe I'm saved by grace through faith alone. I, I believe that it's God's grace that saves me. That's what the book says. And those of us who believe in grace, there's a, there's a, you know, there's something that's leveled against us. There's an accusation that's leveled against us where we're called antinomian, uh, nomos law. And they say, we're anti-law, you people who believe in grace. Well, you know, if you want to say that I'm anti-law as a means to obtain my justification and salvation uh, from God, absolutely then you can call me antinomian all day long. The law doesn't save me. The law doesn't have the ability to save me. The law never had the ability to save me. I could try to keep the law. It won't do. But I respect the law. Paul says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. You know the reason why they accuse us of being antinomian? is because they think that we teach that we can just live however we want because we believe in grace. What they don't understand is that there's a difference between understanding what the scripture says about the way that you're saved and the way that a, a, a person lives their life. There's a difference by saying that, look, when God saves us, it has nothing to do with our merit or our works. It has everything to do with his son. And when we put our faith in what his son accomplished for us on the cross by dying for our sins, that we're saved by grace alone, nothing you can do. But it's a, you know, it's a totally, well then you think you should just live however you want. Did I say that? Have you ever heard a grace uh, teacher say that, well, you should just live however you want? Of course not. So it's a slanderous accusation for those people who don't understand the difference between grace and the law. It's a slanderous accusation from those Galatians who are trying to make a fair show in the flesh and trying to keep the law. The law is good, but it is not a measuring stick to determine my own righteousness or my level of deserved acceptance with God. The law reveals the goodness and the righteousness of God. Therefore, I respect it. That was, by the way, that was perfectly made manifest in his son who died for us, who fulfilled the law. Now, so the law is good. Let it serve its purpose to be the schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. The law is good. Go back to Genesis chapter number 16 now. And the law is good, and it should be subservient to grace. But the law always wants more. The law wants to be the wife. Genesis chapter 16, verse 4. But there can be no mixing of law and grace. 
Grace believers must be strong. Therefore, uh, chapter 16 and verse number six of Genesis says, but Abram said unto Sarah, behold, thy maid is in thine hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Hagar was eventually cast out, like I said. So too, the law is eventually cast out for the covenant of promise. The law is cast out. We're no longer under the law but we're under grace. Can you imagine the, the, the big difference there? The difference of being under the law with the weight of the law and being under grace where the weight is not even so much as a feather because there's nothing for us to do to obtain our righteousness from Christ, from God. So Hagar was eventually cast out, but Isaac, Isaac was never cast out. Who was cast out? Ishmael. Cast out. The law is gone. Now, look over at chapter number 17. It says, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, it's been 13 years since God has appeared unto Abraham. Look it down at verse number 25 there in chapter 17. Verse number 25, and Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh. So the difference between chapter, what happened in chapter 16 and, the, and, and chapter number 17 is 13 years, you know, plus the nine months of pregnancy, right? And the gestation period. So it's been 13 years. What does the number 13 in your Bible represent? Rebellion. 13 equals rebellion. So we find Abraham rebelled, and how long does God wait before he shows back up and knocks on Abraham's door? Knock, knock, Abraham. I'm back. How do you think Abraham felt for that, through those years when there was silence there? There's no record in scripture that God appeared to Abraham. Can you imagine what Abraham was thinking? I, I don't know if you guys are like me. Sometimes I, a lot of times I'll lay there at night and I'll think back through the events of the day and I'll think about all the times I screwed up and how I should have handled this different or how I should have said this differently or how I should have acted different in this scenario. What do you think Abraham was doing for 13 years as he, I, I screwed up. I tried bringing it about in my flesh and I screwed up, and now God's not talking to me. This was actually back in the time when God talked to people. You know, people today think God talks to them. Today, God talks to people through his word. So we don't ever have to go 13 years without a drought, but I can imagine Abraham laying there on his haystack at night or, you know, whatever form of a pillow that he had, second-guessing himself. And here... God appears back to Abraham. And why is it that Abraham had to wait this long for God to come back and fulfill the promise? Why? Why now? Why didn't God, uh, let's set the number 13 aside for the, fa- for the moment and the number of rebellion. Get Romans chapter number four. Romans chapter number four. Here you have Abraham. <clears throat> God promises him this land. He promises him about the seed. You remember that God took Abraham out and told him about the dust of the earth and the stars of the heaven, that this is going to be like your seed. And here Abraham is sitting waiting like, like can't we do this like now? Like, isn't there a drive through that I can go through and just place my order and we can get this taken care of? Isn't there a microwave that I can just set the timer for 30 seconds and have this be done? but he has to wait. He waits. He waits. Why? Romans chapter four, we're going to find that God waited until Abraham came to the end of himself. You know, it's only then that, that God can really work when man comes to the end of himself, right? When man realizes that it's not of my works, 
lest any man should boast. And so God waits until Abraham comes to the end of himself. Look at Romans chapter four, verse number 18. Who against hope believed in hope. It was against hope because it didn't seem very hopeful, right? Who against hope believed in hope. I love that phrase. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. Who spoke it? God spoke it. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old. You remember chapter 17 says he was 90 and nine years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Sarah's about 10 years behind him. And I haven't heard of any 90-year-old ladies giving birth. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Let me ask you a question. Um, (laughs) I was going to use an example within our church, but then I don't want to do that and hurt somebody's feelings. So imagine an older couple. Imagine a really old couple. A hundred years old. Larry, I think Larry Sr., he's 95 right now, I think, or 96. Is he 95 or 96? 95. Imagine Larry Sr. getting married to a bride who is the same age, and they wait five years from now, and they come into the church, and they say, surprise, we're pregnant. (laughs) Larry's grimacing back there. (laughs) Where would you think that that baby came from? My point being is, would it not be clearly evident to Abram and to all those around him and everyone else who has read this book down through the centuries that there was no way that Isaac came about because of Abraham's own flesh or Sarah's own flesh? Nod your head, yes, that would be clearly evident. God came about when man was at his end, when Abram could not bring it about in his flesh to show man, here is life, and God says, I will bring it about. God shows his power when man's power is gone. The Red Sea, Israel's coming and they're fleeing Egypt and they're, they're running on their legs, and they're trying to get away from Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh's chariots versus Israel's legs. Who wins? Pharaoh's chariots. Pharaoh catches up to Israel, and they're at the water. Nowhere for them to go. Man had came to the end of his own power. There was nothing left for him to do. What did God do? When man came to his end, God showed up and showed his power. The cross comes and provides righteousness for man that man could not provide for himself. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 7 says, you can turn there if you want, I'll quote it for the sake of time. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure. What is, what is the treasure that you have as a member of the body of Christ? You ever read the list of the things that you receive the moment that you believe? And you have the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling within you? You know, you don't have your glorified body yet. We're reminded of that. You know, Ken is at home because he's got a problem with his leg. Rich is at home because he's got a problem with his body. We don't have people joining us because of physical infirmities with their bodies. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know, a piece of clay can break. Our bodies can break. 
but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So that when God takes Abraham and brings that son about, the excellency of the power has nothing to do with Abraham and everything to do with God. Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number nine. When Paul is talking about his infirmities in the flesh, what is God's response to him? Does God tell Paul that, oh, Paul, if you only had a little bit more faith, you'd never experience any physical problems on this earth? Isn't that what, you turn on the TV and you go to the Christian networks and you hear the televangelists on TV and half of them are preaching the health and wealth gospel and the other half of them aren't even preaching the gospel at all. But the half that are preaching the health and wealth gospel, what do they tell you? Well, if you were faithful, God will bless you with more money. He'll bless you with physical health, things like that. Paul, how faithful would you say Paul was on the spectrum? You know, Paul was pretty faithful. Thanks for the thumbs up. Appreciate that. Paul was pretty faithful. He prays to God about his physical infirmity, and what does God tell him? Paul, you're so faithful, I'm going to take that right away from you. He says in chapter 12 and verse number 9 of 2 Corinthians, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And what's Paul's response to that? Does Paul turn around and say, oh man, I got a raw deal. This God, he's not very nice. He should, he should really help me out. We, we raise a generation of brats, right? So I'm just imagining you know, a child's response and not getting their way. I had an issue with that last night that I saw out in public at a baseball game, but I, you know, I, I won't get into that. Paul's response is, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul says, if your strength is made perfect in my weakness, give me more weakness. Give me more imperfection. Back in Romans chapter number four, Abram believed, you don't have to turn there, but that's where Abram said that he believed, he was fully persuaded that God was able to do what he said he was going to do. That in my weakness, God can bring about the promise of what he said he would do. So my simple point is this, is that God's strength is made perfect in Abraham's weakness. Why did God wait so long to fulfill the promise to Abraham? Well, if Abraham would have been 70 years old or 60 years old or 50 years old, you would have read this book and thought, yeah, yeah, so he had a child, so what? What God did is bring life from death. Abram had no ability to bring about life from himself. Sarah's womb was barren. We in the body of Christ can also find the, 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 some understanding from, from Abraham's patient wait. Because believers today, they'll ask, when is his coming? Why doesn't he hurry? Why does he tarry? Why doesn't he just come back? Can't you imagine Abraham saying the same thing? Why does he tarry? Why doesn't he hurry? Why doesn't he just bring this about? I can't wait to have a son. I want what I'm promised. And those of us in the body of Christ today, God has promised us a heavenly hope and a glorified body. And we say, we can't wait for our promise. Just come back already. God acts in perfect timing every time. Galatians chapter four and verse number four says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. When the fullness of time was come, when the time was due, In Romans chapter five and verse six, Paul says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number eight says, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. When the, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven called the apostle Paul and commissioned him to go unto the Gentiles with the gospel of the grace of God, the timing was right. God always acts in the right timing. First Timothy chapter two and verse number six, Paul says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
Today we live in a time where the Lord Jesus Christ is being testified of. And yet we, we sit here and we say, Lord, we just wanna go. But every day that's extended is another day of grace. And it's another opportunity for all men to be saved, right? What is it that Paul says? That it's God's, what's the will of God? For all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, when the time of this dispensation of grace is over and things are wrapped up and we're called back home, things are gonna get a lot worse. And there's not, I, I don't think that men are going to be as apt to be getting saved as they are under the dispensation of grace. You may say, wow, Brandon, that's a pretty bold prediction because I don't see many people getting saved today. Yeah, I don't think there's gonna be many people getting saved in the tribulation either. Today we live in a time of long suffering. And so as the timing was right for God to appear to Abraham, so the timing was right for when he sent his son, so also when he appeared to Paul, so too that we can be sure that his coming back will be at the right time. And until then, let us be about redeeming the time and preaching that gospel to people so that way we can, we can see soul saved and that God's will may be brought about by the saving of souls. Why did God wait so long to return to Abraham? To show his power. Why does God wait so long to return today? To show his power. And so, let us not be grumpy as we're prone to do and commiserate as to why we're not up in heaven with our glorified bodies. But like I said, let us redeem the time and preach the gospel, do the work of the ministry, be ambassadors for Christ, and see souls saved. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we're thankful for your word. We're thankful what we are able to glean from it and how you take real history, real people who loved you and real events, and you can come along and have the Apostle Paul write such wonderful examples for us that we learn from back in Genesis chapter number 16 and Genesis chapter number 17. We're thankful for the love of your son and we're thankful for another day of your grace and the ability to, Lord, to, to preach the gospel of the cross, the good news of your son to a lost and dying world. We're thankful and we love you and we praise you in Christ's name, amen.